guess you have to get permission to be recorded. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. It's crazy. Hi, guys. My name is Girish Valley, your host for Back to Basics. Another week of Back to Basics. This is just crazy, isn't it? It's like things are going fast for me and fast for Back to Basics. So, guys, today we have a guest. He's a returning guest, second time. No, there's no reward program here, but I'll just let you know that he's an awesome guy. I've spoken to him many times through email and through chat and amazing person. His name is Steve Hall, Steve M. Hall, MD. Yes, I have to say MD because you know what legalizations, we have to say that. Well, anyway, so guys, today we have Steve. We're gonna talk to you about um, how to train kids. No. How to teach kids. I think that's the better way of saying it. Not train. Because that sounds really, you know, uh, whipping the dog type of thing. And I don't want to do that. So it's actually more about teaching. So let's talk to Steve and let's talk about all the details. Uh, Steve, how are you? And thank you for coming on my show for the second time. Well, thanks for having me. And um, I'm having a pretty good day today. So Awesome. Awesome. So first thing is first, before we get into the basics of the topic, what is Back to basic mean to you for the second time? <laughs> well, back to basic. I, it's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you named your podcast that because uh, I use that saying a lot in my teaching. Yeah. Uh, like with students, I say you get back to basics. And uh, in medicine, that to me means get back to listening to the body. Yeah. Get back to listening to what your life is really trying to say to you. Um, and, um, you know, keeping things simple because things can get complicated way too quickly and then you get lost and bogged down. Yeah. And um, so so now we're going to talk about, you know, back to basics, basically about parenting. Yeah. Because I really believe that good parenting is probably the best preventative medicine there is. Hmm. Because if... You, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. I was going to say, because if you can raise your children uh, to learn how to really know themselves and listen to themselves and, and take steps early before things become a crisis, then they have the tools they need to keep themselves healthy as they go through life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Steve, I mean, it, it's kind of tough that, you know, like we have to talk this way and, and say back to basics because sometimes we tend to forget, you know, uh, the actual root purpose of your goal. Uh, you know, uh, parenting is one of them, and I guess sleeping is another one. And with this COVID going on in the world, we tend to forget what we came in the world to do. And then now yeah. we're doing this. So it's kind of tough uh, to gather your thoughts inside. And I think uh, you're right. I think we sometimes we lose that. So it's better to listen to your body, listen, better listen around the environment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it, it's tough. So, Steve, thank you for coming on my show for the second time. So, what is your thoughts about teaching kids? I mean, I said earlier in the introduction, uh, I don't like to use the word training because it sounds that you're training a dog and I don't want to do that. It's actually more uh, teaching uh, from the basics. So, explain that. Well, I think uh, one of the most important things for a parent uh, is to hold an image in their mind of their child um, being fully capable and competent to live their life. Yeah. And the reason that's important is probably from hundreds of thousands of years of tribal living, uh, but, but we're kind of hardwired to meet the expectations that are placed on us. Mm. And the un, unspoken uh, sort of, unconsciously held expectations are the most powerful as it turns out. So, so if you just expect your child to be competent, to be strong, be capable, be kind, if you just hold that image of them being that way in your mind, they'll try to meet that expectation. Yeah. And so one of the most important things to remember too, is that, uh, you know, we all have a, you know, people have different ideas about this, but we essentially all have a, uh, what a lot of, traditions around the world call your soul. Uh, I call it like your inner intelligence, your inner wisdom, your access to consciousness, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that newborn baby, their soul is just as ageless as anybody else's soul, Definitely. even though 
just temporarily they're in this little tiny body they can't do anything yeah so seeing them as this whole complete human being and they're just going through this growth process um, and so being able to treat them with the regard and the respect that they're due as a complete human being from the very start i think is a really important part of parenting but and but steve it's kind of tough if you think about it sorry to interrupt you there but um teachings from let's say from your time and my time and the kids it's very different right mm -hmm. so how do you pivot over from the old old school way versus today's day schooling because it's tough <laughs> And it's tough um, because you know, the process for the parent is essentially like learning a new language because you're going to just automatically parent the way you were parented unless you take steps to change. Just like you're going to automatically speak the language that you were raised with yeah. unless you take steps to learn a new language. And and it's very similar to where, you know, how they say that, you, you know, you're learning the new language when you actually have a dream in the new language yes, yes, that you're learning. Yes. And, and, and so you don't have to think about it. it the, the, your parenting just changes as you learn a new way to parent. And then the nice thing is for your child, that way of parenting will be their native tongue. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's how we're going to make change in society that, you know, it takes generations actually, because people have to shift and change. But um, we've been doing experiments. Like we've had a whole generation that was, I think raised uh, quite frankly too permissively and didn't have good boundaries and and so there's a lot of angry anxious people out there right now yeah, yeah. as young young adults and um but it turns out you know um, developmental psychologists have identified well again it's debatable but up to at least 12 different kinds of intelligences that we have mm -hmm. So we focus a lot on the cognitive intelligence, and that's what's measured by IQ. But there's also emotional intelligence, there's kinesthetic intelligence, there's music intelligence, there's spiritual intelligence, there's interpersonal intelligence. So um, a lot of people think that cognitive intelligence, you're kind of born with it, you're, there's not much you can do to increase it. But lots of studies have shown that you can actually increase your emotional intelligence. And most of these other intelligences can be practiced and increased as well. And um, so, is it but, so is it something taught or is it something that you born with? Well, I mean, we're, we're born with um, a certain level of all of these intelligences. Yeah. And some people develop them more than others. You know, like the music prodigy obviously has a high musical intelligence that I've been born with. Of course. The natural athlete has a... I can set intelligence, um, but but a lot of it can be learned, and we don't really know the full extent of that. Um, and the um, but what what studies have shown is that people can do things to raise their emotional intelligence, and and what emotional intelligence means in my mind is to learn how to just be really healthy with your feelings, to to know how you're feeling, to to relate to those feelings in a healthy way, and then to be able to um, regulate your behavior, no matter how you're feeling. Mm. And then also to be able to understand and take into account how other people are feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Some and what they've found too is, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, um, a lot of, uh, business consultants are now recommending to their clients that they screen new hires for, uh, a level of emotional intelligence. And there's questionnaires you can give people to do that and and they recommend hiring people with a high emotional intelligence and once they're hired continue to train their emotional intelligence because studies have shown that teams made up of people with high emotional intelligence work better and they're more productive and one person on a team with low emotional intelligence can drag the whole team down hmm. so mean, no no go ahead please please yeah so um so I think it's really helpful, you know, uh, uh, as parents, you can give your children real leg up in life by helping them just grow up, uh, sp just speaking natural, healthy relationship with feelings. And so what does that mean? What is a healthy relationship with feelings? And, um, and I, what comes to mind when I ask myself that question is what I call rule number one and the three A's. 
And, and rule number one says that all your feelings are valid. Okay. And so you never have to say, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. Uh, the fact is you are feeling that way. You can be curious about it. Where did it come from? You know. Mm-hmm. And so the three A's help you do that. So the first A is awareness. You become aware that you're feeling that way. The second A is acknowledge. So what you're doing is you're essentially admitting the truth. Yeah, I really am feeling this way because... So many of us, the second we feel a feeling we don't like, we want to try to change it. We try to make ourselves feel differently. We stuff the feeling or we, there's all kinds of Freudian things you can do with feelings, right? You can uh, project them onto other people, all kinds of different things. Um, but that acceptance helps to undo all that stuff and keep, keep you in your truth in the moment. Mm-hmm. And then the third A is you look the feeling right in the eye and say, okay, feeling, I see you. I know you're here. I'm feeling you. Can you please take me to your roots? And like, when when did I very first experience this feeling? And um, and then you get still inside and sort of trust what rises up. And, and that's that's what takes practice. And what you can help your children learn to do um, is can you go back to when you very first felt that feeling. And and I've seen two kinds of roots. One is that the person might. Actually, the, the a belief might come to mind like, oh, I believe I don't deserve this or I'm not worthy of this. And um, or, or they might have a memory of an experience they went through. Um, oh, yeah, my mom said I need to come along or she'll leave me in the grocery store. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. and how does a toddler feel when they're threatened by the man right, in the grocery right, store? Right. So um, and then so if a person has a memory of an experience, what I ask them to do is. Okay, so what was the conclusion you drew from that experience? And then that generally leads you to the underlying belief that could still be in there shaping your life. So once you uncover the belief, then what you say is, was this belief really true? Mm. And and the question I like to ask is, well, what would my heart say about this belief? Sure. So in other words, what, what would a higher a higher judge or a higher wisdom say about this belief. And a lot of times just, just seeing the belief and asking that question is enough to get the belief to shift to the new higher belief. Yeah. And then the, you can put the new higher belief back in your unconscious mind and it becomes a, a new lens that you peer through to see the world. And, and then the same, you might have the exact same experience that you had a week before, but a whole different set of feelings will come up. Mm. So by doing this work, you don't have to live with painful and, uh, you know, feelings and anxiety and depression and all those things. Um, but by working directly on the feeling itself and trying to make the anxiety go away or whatever, you're not doing anything about what created that feeling in the first place. Yeah. And so teaching your children this process of how to just be with their feelings, get the information from it, because they're the reason rule number one is true that all feelings are valid is that feelings are just the messenger. Yeah. They're not the message, which is a big confusion in our society. They're just the messenger. So, so I asked my patient, I said, does it really matter to you if UPS brings you your package or federal express brings you your package? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, people, matter, it doesn't matter who brings it. I mean, the destination is still the same, right? So, right. But yet they have really different colored trucks, right? You know, so, so we look at our feelings and go, well, we like these feelings, but we don't like those feelings. And so we're going to do everything we can to create these feelings and, and avoid these feelings. And, and that's, and that's feeling management or managing our feelings. And that's what I call addiction. So again, I think by teaching your children to be healthy with their feelings in the first place, they're going to be much less prone to addiction in their life because they won't need to be managing their feelings. But Steve, let, let, me, let me ask you this. You're, you're talking more on feelings and how mm-hmm. to express, but I think expression and explaining from a kid's point of view, is it'll t- it's tough to explain or express, I should say, for kids. Right, so what does a parent actually do when they're faced with a child, right? Yeah. Um, and um, so I've raised four kids. My youngest just turned 26 yesterday. Um, and uh, my wife is actually a um, an educator and childhood expert, and one of my daughters is a uh, psychotherapist, mm-hmm. marriage and family therapist. 
And so we put our heads together. We put together this class called Strong Foundations, um, how to teach your children to be healthy with their feelings. And it goes through each of the ages, like infancy, toddler, preschool, you know, and all up to up to teenage years. And it's an online class. Uh, it's self, you know, you can take it at your own pace, that kind of thing. But it goes through lots of examples um, and of how to actually phrase the wording when you're faced with your child. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like so a good example might be, um, like let's say a child comes to you and they've um, just drawn a picture. Mm -hmm. and, and if you say, oh, what a good picture, um, you know, that's, that's basically giving like praise, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but what if the child themselves didn't really like the picture because it didn't quite come out the way they imagined or hoped it would? Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I could hardly ever get any of my pictures to look at I wanted sure, them to. Sure, yeah. And um, so what are they going to do with that, you know? Whereas if instead you said, oh, I see, you know, a flower and I see the sun and when I look at that picture, I, I get a warm inside. What would they do with that feedback, whether they like their own picture or not? But I think nowadays the kids are more vocal, aren't they? So, so I, I guess maybe it's easier to to express their feelings nowadays. I'm not really sure. But when I grew up, we didn't really we weren't that vocal uh, back in the days. Well, you were trained not to be, right? Right. So th that's a difference, right? I think trained and explaining versus now is like. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe social media has kind of changed the way of thinking and, and the way expressing nowadays, I think, has changed a little. Well, so I want to be really careful here because expressing a feeling is a behavior. Okay. And, and so you can't say that rule number one is true for behaviors. You can't say all, all behaviors are valid. Okay. Right? Yeah. It's okay to want to poke somebody with a knife, but it's not okay to poke them with a knife. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So so there has to be a, like a gap between your feelings and your behaviors. And it turns out that in that gap is where your freedom as a human being lies. Because you're you don't choose your feelings. They just show up in your mind. So, so you're saying thinking versus acting on it. Right. Well, not really thinking as much as, and see, I used to have this confusion myself all the time because I'm a very cerebral person. I'm a very good product of public education and very left brain, right? Yeah. But but it turns out thinking about feelings isn't really the best way to deal with feelings. It's, it's, it's really experiencing the feeling is the best way. Now, what I've noticed is you can't help think about it because that's how your mind knows you're having the feeling. Yeah. Is you're thinking about it, but that's not all you want to do. You want to actually feel it. Like what is it doing to my heart rate? What is it doing to my solar plexus? Hmm. What is it doing to the t muscles in my neck and my shoulders? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so really feeling the feeling and, um, and then when you ask it, so, so that's letting the delivery truck down your driveway is to really feel the feeling. Yeah. And then by asking it to take you to its roots, that's asking it to deliver you the package. Right. That's what you really want. Right. So, so feelings are messengers bringing us information about how we're really operating inside. Mm. And what beliefs do we really hold? And because most of them we don't know about. They're, they're back here in the unconscious part of our minds. Right. And they'll run our life until we can make them conscious get them aligned with higher truths and put the new unlimiting belief back in to replace the limiting belief. Mm -hmm. So teaching our children how to do that uh, gives them a real advantage in life so, because then they can learn from every experience they have. So uh, Steve, let me, let me ask you a question. Um, a couple of months back, I was watching some uh, criminal mind show. Uh, obviously you know what that is, right? The FBI agents and, uh, solving crimes and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But what they do is they, uh, th this one concept I kind of like, and I don't know if it is a true thing or not, and I still have to think about this. They ask the person, it could be an agent, it could be a victim, who could be anybody, and they say, close your eyes and think really deeply 
down behind your your back there and tell me that if you remember each and every moment of what you've done. Do you think that's the same concept as what you're talking about, that it's back of your mind and we just don't think about it and we just hide it at the back there? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, and I'm sure neuroscience has a good way out on that question. The, um, but the way I see the mind is that you only have one mind. Yeah. But we divide it into two parts to talk about how it works. So you have your conscious mind, uh, which is the part you, as your self-identity, your ego, knows about. And then you have the unconscious mind, which is everything else. Hmm. And so if you look at your total mind... The question is, well, how much of it's conscious and how much of it's unconscious? Yeah. And you know how they used to say you only use 10% of your, your mind? Yeah. Well, that was wrong. It's really only 3 to 5%. Yeah, it's quite low. Yeah. Yeah, and the rest of it's in the unconscious. And and so that unconscious is very, very busy. It is um, uh, taking in its own data from your senses. Mm -hmm. It's um, got its own way of processing information. It tends to be very, very fast. So, for example, if you're driving down the road and a car swerves into your lane, your hands and feet are reacting before your conscious mind even says, oh, there's a car coming at me. You know, you're already swerving out of the way. See? Right. But then what I'll do is, as an agent, I'll tell that person, the victim, to close his eyes or her eyes and say, you know what? Do you actually remember the license plate number? Do you actually yeah. remember the color? So I think... Uh, that episode, they kept on hawking on on the person at least 10, 15 times to get the right answer. I think I might have seen that show. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. it, it's quite fascinating that, you know what, uh, it, it seems like the percentage of the thought process, uh, it made me think uh, while you were talking there that are we really that naive that we forget very easily and, 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 well, and the storage is there? The, yeah, so one of the ways to think, and I heard of this uh, talk from Deepak Chopra many years ago, uh, but he said your conscious mind takes in about two parts per billion of the information available. Mm. He said that would be like looking at the world through a drinking straw. Yeah. What you see at the end of the straw is what you think the world is, but that straw is two miles long. Two miles long, right. <laughs> what? <laughs> I wouldn't even see this spot out there. And so your unconscious mind is aware of a lot bigger, has much bigger straw. Yeah. Yeah. And and so you're right. It, with the right practices, I mean, theoretically, anything in the unconscious mind could be accessed consciously. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they try to do with, you know, with hypnosis, with EMDR, with dream analysis. With, I mean, everybody's been trying to get in the unconscious mind ever since the days of Freud. Yeah. Um. And and the way I help people do it is, it turns out your unconscious mind is running your body. Yeah. Yeah. And so by paying attention to your body, you get your foot in the door into the unconscious. Yeah. And that kind of opens up that, that realm for you. But, but you're right. I mean, who knows? And people can be trained with potential movement. Is, is it possible for us to like, open a better channel of communication between our conscious and our unconscious yeah. so that we can actually access a lot of that data? Um, but what I run into in the office is that, um, you know how they say the first seven years of your life are the formative years? Yeah. And the reason that is, is the unconscious mind is operating like a tape recorder with a record button on. Hmm. And so it only takes one experience of something to go right into the unconscious and become this lifelong conclusion that's affecting you. Yeah. yeah. And so how many of us had, you know, gurus and sages as parents when we were little? Right? Yeah, so, I mean... The, the things nowadays with our times, I'm not going to talk about technology because that's just a, uh, you know, one of those easy solutions. But I think we just have a, a short span of thought process in general uh, for adults and maybe definitely for kids. So you tell me if that's right and wrong. And I think that's how we've been trained. Yeah. Um, and some, I don't know, a few years ago, I watched this video taken in the 50s. Yeah. of Gandhi sitting yeah. up on this um, platform and speaking to like thousands and thousands of people spread out before him. Yeah. And he was just droning on and on in this most boring, monotonous. <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking nobody would listen to that today. Sure. Sure. But these people were enthralled, yeah. you know, 
and and they could actually listen to an entire sentence and, and maybe even an entire paragraph. Yeah, yeah. And but we've been trained. A lot of people blame the Se- Sesame Street sort of thing where they, you know, flash from screen to screen to screen really quickly. And like we've been trained to only accept sound bites. Yeah. And and so if you can't present your idea in sound bites, it it's not it's no good. You can't you can't talk to anybody. Well, try to have a conversation as a, a in society about something as complex as healing the healthcare system hmm. with only sound bites. So is it, is it the same thing as people, they say that, uh, what do they say? Um, I only remember your face, but not your name. Well, I don't know. I have that trouble too. So I, I think that's a, a diagnosable condition. <laughs> okay. Okay. This so, I mean, dysnomia or something like that. <laughs> the reason why I say that, because I, I think we just have a, a short span of, saving some data and we only yeah. take bits and bits of different different data throughout the uh our lives i guess well and we're swamped with um information nowadays I mean, when i was a kid we had three tv channels right how many do you have now right hundreds right right and and we didn't have social media and all the advertising there so i think a lot of these filters people put up in self-defense yeah yeah um, but the problem is if we're using those filters, we're trying to relate to our spouse or to our children, um, and not listening and not retaining details about what's going on. So, but a part of that, like I said, a lot of that's our training and, um, but this class goes into a lot more detail. It's, it's, um, four, nine or 10 hours of, of instruction by the time you put the whole class together. And, and there's a lot of exercises and examples and, um, but what do you actually do to help your child become competent with their feelings um, from the very get-go? And if your children are already teenagers, it's not too late to start. You don't have to start when they're infants. Sure. I mean, we're um, I mean, we're just talking adult level of what we were talking about for the last uh, few minutes. But uh, if we're adults are the way we are right now and having trouble. Uh, I, I don't know how we're going to go and train the kids the proper way, well, the way it should be. And that's exactly right. So it turns out quite a bit of the class is actually helping the, the parent to become healthy with their own feelings. Right. If they aren't already. So is, and, is it better to say that we get trained first before we contact and uh, start right. training the kids? Right. Because the best way to teach your children is by example. Yeah. Because they they watch what you're doing uh, a lot more closely than they listen to what you're saying. Of course. And so when you start to become healthy with your feelings and actually live the example of it, that's what they pick up on and start living that example too. Yeah. So so yes, it is actually and and so there's a big advantage uh, for the parents to learn how to raise their children this way is is they can do a lot of their own healing too. Yeah. Yeah. They can help heal any dysfunction they have with their own feelings um because these dysfunctional feelings they lead like i said to addiction to depression to anxiety we're having an epidemic of anxiety right now yeah, yeah. especially in people under 30 it seems like yeah yeah and and the experts disagree like well what's going on what's causing this i mean when i was a kid we had mutually assured destruction hanging over our heads right right we were doing drills for a nuclear attack where we'd get under our desks and sit there yeah, yeah, yeah. as if that would save us against the nuclear attack right yeah i mean when i grew up i mean i had gulf war i had 9 11 i had uh you know uh, tsunami stuff and but not in a bigger scale like that what we are in right now i think this is a huge big scale uh not well i shouldn't say like, that because you the know threat of global warming because, like... uh, yeah i mean there, there are other uh, Spanish flus and all that stuff that we were, went through through World War One, but I'm talking the 21st century. I'm talking like now. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I think this is one of the bigger ones as compared to what we have gone through. I think you're right. I think we're actually on a um, the crux of a, a major change. Yeah. And um, whenever we're in this transition state from... You know, transitioning from one state to another state, yeah. there's always that in between state that's like seems really chaotic and disorganized, and um, and that's kind of where we're at right now as a society. And 
I really hope we're transitioning to us where, you know, we can heal the roots of racism and discrimination and intolerance and, and, and transition to a, a society that is more open and tolerant. And, um, but the way we get there is, you know, all the, all this racism and hatred and stuff has really bubbled up to the surface. Yeah. It's, it's been there. Yeah. But it's been under, it's like under wraps since the 60s, for example. But now it's like, it's like a zip coming to a head. Yeah, but Steve, a couple of weeks back when I released a uh, an episode that I, I spoke with one of, one of my guests about the uh, 21st century pandemics and, and the 20th uh, century pandemic uh, uh, history, uh, World War One was one of the biggest hot topics when we talked about, and we both kind of came up with a conclusion it looks like that world war one ended due to the pandemic at that time so hmm. nowadays they're saying that we are blaming the pandemic for today's time is that why are we blaming the pandemic if we are the reasons have you thought of that well um if, I mean, if you just look at how viruses work and Mother Nature and stuff, um, it's pretty predictable that we're going to have more pandemics just because viruses are constantly seeking vulnerabilities in our immune systems, yeah. um, just like viruses on the computer, right? Right, right. And and they're smart. They you know they get lots of iterations to try different things, and so every once in a while, a virus is going to come out that has found a unique vulnerability that we have. So we're going to keep getting these pandemics. The issue is how do we respond to them? Right. And I really think that what this pandemic has done is exposed our underbelly, so to speak. Yeah. And we have the tools. We knew with this pandemic that if people just isolated, wore masks, um, you know, as much as possible that we could really slow down the spread. That was proven over and over and over again, all these different communities who did that. Um, but then it, there was enough people that weren't doing it that the virus kept going. And this virus is contagious enough that it didn't need very many. When, when people relaxed the restrictions and started mingling again, the virus would rise back up again, right? That's right. Because of how um, virulent it is. Yeah. So it basically out it had more patience than we did. <laughs> That's why we're having, yep. you know, look at what's happening in India right now where, you know, they locked down and did a really great job when uh, a year ago, you, you know, in March of 20, when it broke out, but it's, they just, people can't wait long enough. And now they're doing more mingling and they're having to lock down again. And, but, you know, I was just reading the other day, the estimated death rate is so much higher than the official report. And, yep. I've talked to my patients who have family there and it's just a mess. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, so what it's really doing is showing us aspects of ourselves. Sure. And, um, and even back in, in 2018, there or 1918, there were a whole contingent of people who refused to wear masks. So it's not like we've learned anything <laughs> the last hundred years. Well, I mean, there's one thing that we have definitely learned uh, if uh, during these times. I don't know if you agree, but I've seen the change. Is yes, we are wearing masks due to this pandemic. When we are wearing this mask, if you notice that the flu season and the pollen season has has reduced down as compared to last year and the year before that. Maybe not right. last year, but the year before that for sure. Yeah, from my perspective as a physician, we hardly even had a flu season this year. You're right. Exactly. Exactly. So we know that these so, so these techniques work. That there is, I mean, it does work if you follow it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's how I look at it. Um, it's kind of like a diaphragm, you know. It doesn't work if it's on the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> so, Steve, any last words before you go? This is like great uh, talking, uh, you know, detailed stuff with, uh, with you here. Well, it's so just so one one take home message is. It is possible to increase your and your children's emotional intelligence and doing so will give them a big advantage in life. And we know how to do it. The tools are there. Really just take the time to check it out and, and start 
um, learning how to to work with your own feelings and then teach your children how to work with theirs. It is it's very doable. Yeah, yeah. Steve, thank you again for coming on my show for the second time. It, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry I don't have a rewards program, but next time, <laughs> but next time when you come, you, there will be a rewards program for you. How about that? Well, you're innovating very quickly. I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so but much. Thanks, Garrett. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for coming on my show again. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So guys, we spoke with Steve today. We talked about the details of how to train and teach kids. But before you do that, you know what we got to do? We got to teach ourselves. Now, if you don't teach ourselves, then how are you going to go and teach the kids? It's like a ripple. It's like catch 22 as what they say. So just keep in mind that you got to train yourself at the same time. But here's a quote of the day. As usual, there is a quote. And the quote is, children are educated by what the grown-ups is and not by his talk. So that's what it is. And that's what we talked about today, right? Teaching the kids the way we should be teaching them. So guys, as usual, as always, at the end of the episode, what do I always say? Remember, everything in life goes back to basics. And that's what we did today, guys. We went to the basics of teaching the kids the right way. Guys, as usual, as always, comments made good or bad. Either way, it will make my show stronger. Quality guest, quality content, and definitely quality host. So guys, as usual, as always, you take care, God bless, and I'll see you next week. Next week's episode on Back to Basics. I lost weight. Um, so weight loss is a huge, it, and I think people, it's, it's a huge problem, issue for some people. And I think we should look at it more as weight management instead of losing the weight because you can lose the weight. That's actually losing weight is not that hard. People mm -hmm. are going to, your listener may not want to hear that yeah. because if you follow whatever it is you follow, you will lose the weight, right? Whatever the diet is or your regimen, the thing is how do you keep it off? Mm -hmm. And also why are you doing it? Hmm. Is it a so, health issue? So yeah. regarding weight loss, or I should say weight management, do you think mm -hmm. it's more 